I hope we're all progressing, aren't we? Yes. Hmm? Amen. We may need to make that decree. We're progressing. Right? We're not going back. We're not doing any of those things. We are progressing in the kingdom of God. Moving, you know, well, we're moving on up. Actually, the east side is right, isn't it? I never thought about that before, but it's like, and, and uh, did you know that the Jews, Jewish community is usually on the east side of the city? In the different cities? So we're moving on up. We're going to eventually move over to the east side if, the, if he's up there. Now, he'll come and say that's not true, but no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Hallelujah. Well, we want to welcome a very special friend that we have here with us this morning. Hallelujah. That was with us for years and years, Deborah McKaylee. She was one of the elders here, her and her husband. And uh, they moved away on us. They moved down to Florida. Who would want to move to Florida? No, no, I'm not, you're not playing along with me. You can, Florida for the past two days, I think. Yeah. Two or three days. <laughs> That's right. Well, I think I think the main thing is that there's some nice golf courses and all that stuff down there yeah. where you can play year all round, year round. round and all that in his retirement. Did, did you want to say anything at all? Oh, I just good to be here and see you all and, and you know, build the presence of the Lord. Yeah. And uh, you know, you, you're a part, but you're not. Oh. Your hearts, there's a, your hearts are always, and you kind of just pick up right where you left. It's like, you know, we left at the end of 2018. Wow. And it's been that long already? Yeah, see? Well. It doesn't seem that way, does it? No, it doesn't. So, yeah. So God is good, and, you know, we have our ups and downs down there, just like you all. You yeah. Know? And, but we're, we're standing. And how, long, how long were you here? You were here for quite we a few here. years. Roughly. Uh, well, we lived here in 90, uh, March of 99, and you know when we started out. Yeah. I think it was, it was after uh, 911, uh, okay. sometime after that, so maybe 2000. So, so you might have been here eight, eight, nine years with us, yeah. at least. Yeah. Oh, anyway. But yeah. uh, there's special people, and we sure miss seeing them go. Amen. She used to lead, lead worship here. I, and, uh, I tried to get her to come up and, and whatever. I didn't want to put pressure on because I, I hate when I go someplace and they try to pressure me to do something that I'm not ready for or don't want to do. So I uh, didn't want, but I thought it would have been neat to have her play a song for us. But I came that close. Sometimes the Lord says, stick music in your bag. Yeah. And it's like, and then I show up and they say, well, our stuff doesn't work or so and so's not here and, you know. And that's been happening a lot lately. But anyway, it was before we came down here, I thought, like, it went through my mind, and I thought, where? You know? And I did. If I would have had the Hebraic song, I know the song, I would have probably, you know, the Lord just guides you what to stick in your bag. And so... Did, did you realize that we have them all over here still, the ones you used to play? Yeah, you do. <laughs> 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 No, I don't want to put pressure, but we used to. That's right, but. Yes, well, it would have, it would have been a treat for us. But yes, amen, amen. I didn't think any that it needed to be added to. I was looking for my benefit to hear that all again. So it was very selfish of me. But yeah. So praise the Lord. So we have Brother Tom back. Hey. Yeah. It's been a while since he's spoken. He's been in and out of the hospital, rehab, and, and oh, rehab might not be a good. It's okay. So, it's all right. <laughs> but, uh, Let's do it all. It's so good what to it is, have, what him, it is. have him back, and uh, he's going to bring us the word this morning, probably, and fill us in a little bit on all the things God's been doing in his life. Uh, he's, changed, this he's, whole, he's changed that. Through this whole thing, I thought you were already perfected. Uh, so he, he's still working on you. Oh my gosh! <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, praise the Lord, Father. We just pray a blessing upon Tom this morning as he brings us a message in the Word. Whatever you have laid upon his heart, we just 
give you praise for Tom for bringing him through this. In Yeshua's name, amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody in Zoom land. <laughs> so, <clears throat> the Lord is so funny. And he's also, one of his covenant names is Jehovah Sneaky. <laughs> you snuck in on us for sure. <clears throat> All right, so <clears throat> Wednesday evening, pastor asks if I can bring the word. Well, I was prepared to bring the word next week and not this week, but then again, <clears throat> we're always supposed to be ready in season or out of season. Isn't that correct? So it's really not hard. It's just, it's just you'd, you'd like to have the memo come a little sooner, but that's okay. That's all right. So I thought I knew where the Lord wanted to, where, what he wanted to do. I mean, he's been doing, in my life, he's been doing phenomenal things, and I could very easily give you testimony of what he has done in my life uh, particularly through this, this visit at the hospital. I'll just shortly, shortly comment. The Lord moved on people when I was in Riverside to his glory. I've been waiting to hear this. You've been waiting to hear this? You're not going to hear it today. <laughs> You're not going to hear it today because, because the, Lord, the Lord has literally directed me to a specific message that is not regarded to, uh, to the hospital stay and what he's been doing in me personally. Yet there are personal things in here, but, but he's leaving the message for that testimony of, of what he's been doing and did in, in the hospital and thereabouts for a later date. Except he really moved in Riverside. I could not help but not proclaim his name. And doctors and nurses and people in Riverside responded because the spirit touched him. And that isn't me. That's all I'll say. You were in the river. I was in the river. Riverside. I was in Riverside. <laughs> the title for my message today is that he has given me is you are a city. This little one that you see on the floor, he is a city. He is making him a city, a habitation of the presence of God. Lord, I just want to, I, I just want to, I just, just want to take your hand. This, I want everything to come out the way that you make it come out. I, I, it, I reject all fear. I reject all places in the past where the enemy has put in me places where, where he'd love to stir up places of rejection and fear of man. I want to stand in the place, Lord, where the only thing that I see is you looking at me your face shining on me and your approval and hear your words behind my, my ear saying, you're my son whom I love. Let me not only feel that, Lord, but let them feel that too. I want to have you turn to Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. We're going to go through some scriptures today. And that's a good thing. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Right here, we have the foundation point, one of the foundation points, because Scripture continually puts us in places of allegory. We have allegory that we are the planting of the Lord. There's... there's 
all different types of ways that he shows us to try to give us understanding for how he and his kingdom works and how everything fits. Now, let me tell you what I found over the years is we read everything in this word and we complicate the pajibers out of it when it's actually so simple that we it just kind of goes over our heads. The Lord today wants to put things in a different in a different perspective so that we see things and catch things with what he's doing in the perspective of the fact that he makes us literally cities. So here in Matthew, in Matthew 5 and verse 14, he's literally saying that we are cities. We are a place of influence. We have places that he gives us even at that young age with Eric holding his son. That little child has been given authority over what he sees and makes decisions even now for his life. He is becoming a city unto himself. And if it's done correctly, that child right there in Eric's arms will gain an influence through the through the through the through the God of his choice. He will become an influence to make to, to bring and influence the kingdom of God towards other individual people, to create this building blocks, the building blocks of individuals and families into city states that literally have connections through the spirit of God not because they hold the same decisions and look at things the same way, but because there's the bond of unity in the spirit, like kind draws like kind, and all of us together become a habitation of the presence of God that takes over the world. The Amplified of Matthew 5, 14 reads, you are the light of Christ. To the world. A city on a hill cannot be broken. John 8, go to John 8 12. Again, therefore, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. You see who we have in us as a city. When we're a city, I want to point out that, that the, we are not the light. We are not the light of our own city. We, we are not the, the thing that has life or light in it. He is. He who follows me shall not walk in the darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is what we set on the hill. Jesus spoke to the people and said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. In 2 Corinthians, verse 3, that comes right after 1 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. You are our letter written in our hearts, known and read by all men, being manifested that you are a letter of Christ, cared for by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God on tablets of, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. If you take a look at, at how evangelism was done in, in the Old Testament, and even and even a lot of the new. Evangelism was primarily done by Israel being a life, living life 
showing people that the way that they were doing life, the decisions that they had made, they work. Yes. And there's a comparison then that the way that other people have decided to, to live life and do, and do community and do government particularly does not work like it does with the Jewish people. That's actually the event. So it's a lifestyle evangelism. So when Paul, when Paul writes this uh, part of, of 2 Corinthians, he's basically, uh, we need to understand that this is basically his perspective. You are our letter written in our hearts, known and read by all men. People see and observe what, what, the decision, how I'm living my life, known and read by all men, being made manifest that you are a letter of Christ cared for by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of the human hearts. What does that part of that, what does verse three sound like? Well, it sounds exactly like the new covenant. So if we take a look at Jeremiah 31, 33. We find that same language. I'll start in verse 27. Jeremiah 31, 27 speaks, starts to speak of the new covenant. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man and with the seed of beast. And it will come about that as I have watched over them to pluck up, to break down, to overthrow, to destroy, and to bring disaster, so I will watch over them to build and to plant, says the Lord. In those days, they will not say again, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge, but everyone will die for his own, for his own iniquity. Each man who eats the sour grapes, his teeth will set on edge. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made from, with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand, to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant, which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will be on their heart, and I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach again each man his neighbor, and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So this new covenant, this is the thing that we are designed by the Lord to accept, to embrace, to believe, to have made a decision internally that this is the way that my life will be governed. I am deciding, when I came to the Lord, when, I, when we all came to the Lord, we came to the Lord through the cross. It took care of things that we saw in Jesus who, when we took a look at his life, we basically saw a couple of things. We saw that the life that he had and the people who did what he did and followed him had a life of fruitfulness that literally could be called righteousness. And everybody from the time that they are born want and fully desire to live and be right with what they do. Am I preaching good? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Come on. Come on. 
<clears throat> it's good to be back. I have people in my family who have made commitments to get married to one another. A man and a woman. And in the middle of that, there comes another woman and circumvents the whole thing and now the marriage is on, is blown up and so nothing's gonna happen with it. The man who stepped out on his fiance and stepped out with another woman claims that he did nothing wrong. What is he doing? He is trying to cover himself over with some kind of righteousness. Yeah. Fig leaf. Fig leaf. <clears throat> we, we have to have, we have to be, we have to have certain things. The Lord made us where we want to be right. There's, we also want to stand in a place where we operate out of truth. Now, unless we are not connected to the Lord, then, then we will decide what truth is for ourselves. And this is where the scripture says they did what, what they thought was right in their own eyes. But everybody wants to have those two basic things as foundations and then also have a love and acceptance for those things that they call truth. Truth governs a life. I have been given authority, the ability to be able to make a decision to decide this is right, this is wrong. Who has that decision making capability, each individual. That young boy right there is making decisions for what he thinks at this age is right or wrong. He has doors open, however, that accept his parents as an influence for helping him decide what is right and wrong. But he's gonna grow and grow and grow and make decisions continually with proper input and he's going to end up making final decisions that get cast finally in concrete and get firmed in him. And he's gonna walk out of the house one day with his own operating system for what he believes is right and wrong and for what he believes is righteous for him to do. He's gonna gather around him like-minded people that say, your decisions are like my decisions. I will live with you. That's a, an area of influence. The Lord started this whole process with me in teaching this one morning here within the last week, week and a half. And I, 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 the Lord says, you, you know I make you a city. You know I give you all authority over your own life. I said, what do you, talk to me. Talk to me. The Lord says, okay, he, he takes this circle. It's like a carpet, a circle. And, and he puts it on the floor. And then he takes me as a baby, as a young child, and sets me in the middle of that. He says, that's your area of influence that I have given to you. That's your life. It's not yet formed, but it's, but it's the thing that I have given you total control over. Don't give it away. I started to see myself and started to see every child. Every child comes into, into the world in a place where, where we don't understand. They start making decisions with their soul immediately. I commented the last time that two weeks ago when I saw the little one here, he, is, he has such an observant nature but it really highlighted the way that we all are. His eyes do not stop looking at his environment 
and assessing everything. You could see it. he was like this constantly, and he, he's, he's like overstimulated. There's, he's extremely stimulated, but he's making decisions about what he sees in his world. We wonder when, when a child is four years old, how did they get to this where they've got decisions about how life is? They're starting now. They're starting now. <clears throat> but the Lord started to say, okay, each individual child is growing up into a place where in my word, they stand at the place of what they have built called their life. And they stand in a place of the authority that I have given to them. And they sit at the gate of their soul to evaluate what comes into them or what does not come into them. Please. Yeah. Uh, so what you're, is that on? What you're, what you're saying is, and I've observed this with him is that what he's evaluating at a base level is where am I safe and what's safe to me. And, and what I'm picking up from you is that we, as we enter into our Christian walk, we're doing the same thing. And he's trying to evaluate where is the safe place, who are the safe people that are around me, and making connections on where to open myself up to and how, what I will agree with and what I will allow to be in my presence. That's exactly right. So it starts off with base things of what's good for me, what's not good for me, what causes me to survive, what gives me food, what get, you know, where, where do I have lack of food? All of those things are very basic. The, the, the things that are evaluated continue to get more and more complex as a child grows. But what they're setting in place is the government of their lives whether they know it or not, whether I know it or not, the government of how will I live. And one major component, there's two major components that are there. There's a fear thing that says, don't go that way, that will harm me. But the second major, com major component is, is pleasure. Yeah. And this is wired into everybody. Wired into everybody. <clears throat> well, why do we need to know this? Well, we need to know this because for a lot of reasons, but, but first and foremost, one of the things that's happening is today's Father's Day. I didn't even realize it. But the Father has said basically in heaven, I will give you a voice as a parent to be an influence so that that child can understand what real truth is and, oppose, and, and see it from truth that looks like truth that's not really truth, to give you that ability. And I will speak not only to you, but I will show you how to connect that child to my voice so that my government can be with him for the rest of his life. That's good. <laughs> Jesus in Revelations 21 is spoken of in allegory that he is the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven that the habitation of all of us will be living literally in him that the light of New Jerusalem has no sun. It is him who is the light. That same thing, everything in the kingdom, <clears throat> if I can use a word that's kind of strange, is scalable. Do you know what that word means? It means that, that the same thing that you see in the big picture actually happens on, the, to, on an individual level. So everything that's happened in this book <clears throat> on a big level, uh, 
the exodus, the, the, just one thing after another, literally doesn't happen just in those big pictures. It's actually things that happen to me in my life. He wants, he wants us to be connected. His objective is that that little one right there What's the Lord's, what's the Lord going to do with that boy right there? Well, it doesn't make any difference what he's going to be. It makes total difference that he's connected to the father. Because, because if he's connected to the father, then he'll live the life that he's designed to have. This book from the beginning to the end speaks of one child, one son, And the pattern son here, the behold, the volume of the book is written about me. I have come to do your will, Father. <laughs> I can safely tell you that, that the design of the Father is to make you, as a man or a woman, totally conformed to the image of his son. This whole book is a manual for what the sun looks like. How, okay, I tell you that this is done in simplicity. In simplicity, <clears throat> how does a person, how does this child at this age start to make decisions? He makes them based upon what he beholds. <laughs> I saw something that was awesome, uh, a little baby that was born, and, and the father used to speak to it while it was in the womb, and it showed that the baby was born, and they laid it, and, and everything, and it is just laying, you know, whatever, and it's like the father came over and started speaking to it, and the baby broke out into his big smile because it recognized the voice. And what I'm hearing you say is, is that, you know, even as a young child, you're recognizing the voice and you're being brought up. But it's like, it's like when we're born again and everything and we hear the, the voice, it, you know, it, it increases. But that smile that came over that little baby when he heard his father's voice because it was familiar to him. And it was, and it was like, uh, it just, a, just the biggest great smile. Absolutely. Uh, it, it just, it just, Tickled me when I, I mean, it was, it was an awesome thing. Anyway. That child knew that that voice was safe. That child knew that that, he recognized that voice and knew that it was truth. That child on a base level knew that that was the right place to go to be able to receive that voice. The scripture says the same thing that says, when you are saved, you will not listen to the voice of another because it's not safe. All right, that's good, it's excellent. We're born in this circle of influence. We have been given authority over what we let into us. Where is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is within us. Where is the kingdom of darkness, by contrast, within us? If we have the right word in us, then we'll be full of light. If we have the wrong word in us, we will be full of darkness. It's an internal thing, but we've been given the decision of how and when that happens. Dan, you want to use the microphone because people on Zoom can hear you. We just broke that thing down, don't we? It's great. It's a good answer. He is. Uh, when you said that, I, I thought of like, uh, and you can maybe it's just a different perspective. No, please go ahead. Um, I I just the first thing that came to us when you said, uh, or to me when you said that uh, the the kingdom is within us, but in contrast, the kingdom of the world 
to me is out there, but he puts his, he speaks to us and then it gets within us if we accept, and then we listen to that voice. Perfectly said, which is exactly my point. Okay, so we have been, we hear it, we, we, we don't stop the voices externally, but we come to a place where we make a decision. I fully agree with, what's, with what I'm hearing. Let that come in, that's a part of me. I'm gonna operate out of that thing now. It's what we let in the city gates. So the scripture for this, according to the fact that we are a city, is the scripture that says, Lift up your head, O ye gates. You are the gate for the city that is you and for the people who you influence and who agree with you. That's Psalms 24, verses 7 through 9. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and let the King of glory come in. This, okay, so we're in, we're made of three components. We're made of spirit, we're made of soul, we're made of body. What part of that three part being that we're made as, what's the decision part of man? His soul. So, <clears throat> So we are, now listen to me really carefully here. We are born into a culture. If you were born in the black community, you'd be born into the culture of black America. You would be submerged in it. You would be baptized in it. Because of what you see, you would be, as you grow, you would exhibit the culture that you have been immersed in, the culture that you have seen. It's acceptable, it didn't hurt anything, you put it in you, you didn't. So we are born into a culture in the world that literally is a culture of the world. You and I have to understand fully that as we have little children and, ha and also have responsibility for the choices in our lives, that to follow the Lord is actually anti or against the culture that you're already immersed in. This is, so if you, let me tell you this, because this, this hits home to me. I'm going to smack you upside the head, so just be ready, but I'm going to do it in love, because this is me. If you're passive, you're in trouble. Yeah, that's right. right. That's right. Can I say something? Yeah. We're talking about light and darkness. I got you. <laughs> Dan said about light and darkness, and what you said, the Lord speaks to Job about this, and he describes it. He says, where is light going? But when he talks about darkness is where does darkness dwell? And the implication is light is always moving. We have the speed of light. Darkness is still. It's, still, it's not doing anything. That's right. It's passive. That's right. And it occupies and it leaves you there. People who don't follow the Lord do not set clear objectives for their lives and end up with a life that is lived and they're almost in the grave, close to me, and wonder what happened to my life. Why didn't I accomplish anything? Like this. <clears throat> the operating system of the way of the choice of of how of of the decision of how of what government you have decided to live under is totally your choice and you're responsible for it i'm responsible for it it's all about what you let in the eye 
Now let me let me go back to Genesis three. You know, I kind of like Genesis three. <laughs> oh no. no. Because it's taught me. Okay, so so in Second Corinthians that says, or second yeah, Second Corinthians three, and I want to say fourteen, it says that you become what you behold. As you look at Jesus, you become like him. The scripture ties that back to that ties that back to the fact that that there uh, the veil is done away in Christ. Yeah, that's right. But he, yeah, so so when you are blinded, so Adam and Eve, going back to chapter three of of Genesis, they have this thing that they can't see the true image of the Father anymore. They have a different image that's put before them. They didn't change because they were bad. They changed because all they could see was evil in front of their eyes. And they agreed with it. Let me submit to you that that's what the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of hell looks exactly like. Have you ever lived there? I have. And I ain't going back. Because I know that I can make decisions that say, I don't have to live in that place of darkness because the promises and what I see the Lord and who the Lord is, every promise and every word, I'm either going to live out of a word that I agree with that I'm a piece of scum and not worthy and, and all of that stuff, which is a lie. If I agree with that, I get to operate out of the government of darkness. I'm not going to do it anymore. I don't have to because of Calvary. There is no accusation that says that is any truth anymore, that holds any truth in my life that says I am responsible for something that I did that was wrong in the past and I have to pay for it. I need first and foremost to agree with Calvary and the word that's been spoken by his death and by his blood. When I stand in that place where I see and I accept and I receive what the Lord has done for me, he has made me righteous, not with my own righteousness, but he gave me his. I operate now out of a new truth, a thing that says he paid for my every fault. He made everything that that I did wrong. He took it, canceled the debt. I no longer have to come into a place where I pay for that with receiving a curse for what I've done wrong. It's canceled in him. I need to believe that. And as I start to believe that truth, the government of my life comes under right government and under headship of him. I start to live in a place where I see what he has done. And as I see what he has done, I know where I am and who I am. So I become a city that gets really happy. And as I see and operate out of a righteousness and a truth, guess what happens to my desire? Every desire that I had for anything unrighteous gets changed into a place where my passion is I have to be with him. Not just right now, but every moment. The scripture says that in the things that the Jewish people hold in highest value is the Shema. They repeat it three times a day. Simplicity is how things operate and how people grow and change and come into places of true government. My job is to burn with the fire of desire for him even before every member of my family. Because if they're tied into a government of darkness, they will challenge the government of light. And if they make me decide between my family and the Lord, guess who I'm going to choose? I better. To anybody who does not operate out of the government the, the, the place where 
where they've chosen the government of God to be the operating system of how they live their life. Everybody who does not choose that, who's chosen a different way, I smell like death to them. Hmm? So authority is given to each child. We are told, take that little child and raise them up, train this child up in the way that they should go. I have people in my family, grandchildren, who have parents that have no operating system in the Lord at all. Everything's okay. I have an influence, not as a parent, not my job, to specifically put the, do what a parent is supposed to do. However, I have, an, I, have, I have an operating system in me and I have an influence over my grandchildren that is, that is different from anybody else. Nobody else has the influence like I do over a grandchild. And they can see, referring back to this, the, where we started from, they can see that my life and the things that go on in my life and the way that I respond to them out of love and not hatred, that every curse I meet them with a blessing, I come and I operate out of the love of God to them and it's different from what they have at home. I present a choice. I do not bend their will. I do not demand that they go my way, but what I give them is a choice. And the Lord with all of us has never put any of us into a place where he says, come my way or burn, baby. The Lord always puts it a choice in front of us the spirit of God and the way that the whole system operates, us being three-part beings, the spirit always is first. The every, so, so the spirit of God puts truth in front of a person. What happens and what does that look like? Well, what is, what's the spirit? How do we know when the spirit has come? We're going to have our conscience speak to us. That's going to be the voice of God. Our imagination is going to be stimulated. That's a spiritual quality. And our, and our intuition. We're going to know something that we haven't seen physically. We're going to understand that there's truth that's there. We're being touched by the spirit. That spirit, we have to discern whether those things are out of the kingdom of God or out of the kingdom of darkness. Are you following me? Yeah. Because <clears throat> at my weight, I can have the imaginations of cheesecake. And you know, that's not necessarily God. <laughs> but it's good. <clears throat> Your responsibility and my responsibility put just, just flat out laid on top of the table. My responsibility and your responsibility is to know the word of God and carry that as my operating system, the thing that I've decided and I will follow and I will not turn away from it. Use that as my operating system of truth in my life. And everything that does not agree with that, I shut it off. But, but the things of the spirit are gonna be presented to me and they're gonna come and be presented to what? My place of decision. It's gonna to come to my soul and be presented as a place. Tom, you feel this intuition and this pull. To, you know it's God and you know that it lines up with the word of God. The spirit of God is wanting you to go this way. How do you decide? Do you go that way or do you not? Every time the spirit of God comes, 
I have a decision to make. Every time. Isn't just that I got saved once and now everything's fixed and I don't have to think about anything anymore and be passive. No, 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 no. No, because I have a decision to make about that because the decision that I make about that is going to qualify what I do in the physical with my body. I do not make a decision. If I make no decision and do not involve my body, I have said no to the thing of the spirit. You have to have, we are being saved, spirit, soul, and body. I want to submit to you that it's all tied together. If, I challenge you, just go into the word and, and take a look at the things that involve worship. And worship is the most important thing that you and I can do. Why? Because it makes us look at the king. And when we behold the king, we become like him. It's the most important thing that you can do. <clears throat> when I abide and when I look at the king, when I come to worship, I will, I tell you this truthfully, there is no place in scripture that mentions worship or a form of worship that does not involve fully some aspect of the body, your physical body. Raising hands, laying on the floor, posture, of, you know, I mean, all, it's all there. Why? Because it's spirit that is moving us to come into a place of worship, a decision that says yes, and the body follows. This is why the scripture says faith without works is dead. It isn't a, a disconnect with I get to live a, a Christian life over here and don't involve it in action. If action doesn't come, I'm not living in the, in the truth. But we become what we behold. I could point out to you that this absolutely holds true, whether it be the kingdom of God operates, and the way that things operate, operate the way that God set things up. The enemy has to use the format for the, for the way that things were set up by God. There is no dual system. He twists the system and he, <clears throat> because God set things up that we are to become the, we are to behold the image of the father and become the son that looks like the father. When he does that, if the enemy comes in and removes the image of the father and puts torment in front of your eyes and all your imaginations of your heart, then can't get away from the torment of your mental things, of your mental imagination, you start to believe it and become it. Do you have anybody in your family who's living this now? I do. The good news is that, that the Lord comes and through the cross, he absolutely can take that away. Absolutely can take that away. But he doesn't reform my old man. He doesn't take my old man and change him. He kills that old man, which harkens back to understanding all of the Old Testament, where we go in and we take a city, and the, and the thing that the Lord is saying is, you take that city and you kill everything in it. That's why it's there. It doesn't mean that I go into Arab countries now and the promised land is, is Israel, even though it is, and anybody who doesn't agree with that, you know, I slaughter the Arabs. I mean, that's not the thing that's happening. It is a thing that, that the things that I have disagreed with that are not truth from the word of God, I am not to hold on to that in my life ever again. That's the death that it suffers. And there's a new operating system and a new truth that gets put into place, and that's my resurrection life. But what that looks like is it looks like I knew what life looked like when I couldn't see God. I knew I had to live it this way to survive. 
because I got to survive. I'm going to make decisions. And so I'm, there's no condemnation in this. This is just the reality of the way that things operate. I take and I see that those things, they, they didn't give me anything. They, they, you know, I try and do that and keep my, and make decisions for my own life and, and hell would continue. It never stopped. Now I see this, I ain't doing this anymore. So that part of my old man is, is gone and done away with. And now I'm resurrected in him. And his word is my operating system. <laughs> I need to be reminded. <laughs> uh, the Lord's got a couple of things. First of all, I need to be reminded that that for me to preach to the people who I love because I care for them, don't do what you're doing, does not work. I need to live my life so close to him that everything works and flows and, 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 and it's caught. The, 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 the intuition, the imagination, the, the conscience, all of those things are now dealt with and experienced by the person that I love that's in darkness and it touches them. That's the spirit of God wooing them saying there's a different way that's a whole lot better. And, I, and they make a decision based upon the choice that's now in front of them. I've got a I can operate out of, out of promises with family. This family member thing is very important to me because there's my daughter is not walking with the Lord. I have another grandson whose family is totally doesn't walk with the Lord. So these things are, I care about my family. It's a responsibility given to me to take care of my family and to do the right thing. And that doesn't stop when you hit 69 years old. It doesn't stop for anybody here who has a, who's a parent or, or has loved ones that they care about and wanting to, wanting to spend eternity with the Lord. But I have promises in the scripture that I can appropriate by faith and never do anything to come over to influence in the wrong way. I can, I, can be, I can rest in the word of God. I can become like Abram when the Lord says to him, you're going to have a son. And against all things that I see and the enemy wants to put in front of my eyes, this is illogical, Tom. What is wrong with you? You are not seeing the truth. Yet the truth is not from the enemy and the things that he gives me and puts in front of my eyes. The truth is what the word of God says. And that's where I need to stay absolutely strong. This is a word of encouragement for all of us. So I take those places where, where things are not right and I search the word to find out what my, where my promises are for my family from a place of covenant. And I don't care what hell gets stirred up. I ain't leaving that word because that word will come to pass in my family's life. Every child has had authority given to them. They either learn by good parents to, to put that into the word of God and learn how to use, to, to use the word of God as a government for their individual lives. Or they get a bit of Jesus and they become covenant people and they let everything 
everything go, and they have then no authority, all of their authority, even though they're covenant people who have given their lives to Jesus, and they look like people who Nehemiah came after in the Old Testament, with every wall broken down and the word of the enemy controlling their lives, and they had nothing to say about it. Don't think that, that, doesn't ha that this doesn't happen to a believer. But the Lord can always put it back right. Nehemiah is a type of the Holy Spirit. Nehemiah is a type of, of, of the word of God being spoken, and we're going to do this word of God, and we're going to put the government of God back into your lives. They agreed, and they what happened? There was the spirit that was released through Nehemiah. There was the agreement of the elders and everybody in that city, and they physically did stuff. That's right. yeah. It's all three. That's right. it, listen, I really feel strongly that the Lord is saying, not just to this group, but I think that this video is going to go bigger than what, than what we just have. But You have a part to play physical action. You will be involved or you are playing a game of religion only. The cross restores my authority. I got my authority from him he gave me back my authority. What is my authority? My authority is to know the word of God. And when I don't, when I, and to, to, when it's, when something else is presented to me, I look at it and I do not passively say, well, let me think about that. I look at the thing and say, no, 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 no. It is written a different way. You've twisted things. That's my authority. You've got it back in the cross. I've got it back in the cross. Don't give it away. This is a strengthening word. This is a wake up time. Now I'm gonna tell you, I believe that the Lord is waking not only us up in this little body, he's waking the church up to step back into the place of, uh, of, of understanding that we've been given authority over our own lives and we, we are able through the word of God to direct our lives in places where we always stay in the blessings of God. We come to the place where, <clears throat> where <laughs> I'll, I'll give it to you this way. Hebrews chapter four. Um, talks about the sword of the spirit. It talks about the sword of the spirit being able to divide between joint and marrow between, you know, it comes to the core. Listen, let me tell you something. Tom understands fully now that if I don't have places where the Lord where I'm reading the word and I'm standing before the Lord and in full pursuit of all my desire for him, there are gonna come times where the Lord says to me, take a look at my word and what you're doing. If I don't come to places where I am, where I am, where it stings, and I understand that there's places where I'm off base, I'm not in the full passion of following him. Yeah. Easy peasy Christianity where nobody grows up and we're all children and we live in little utopias is not the reality of the way that anybody's life is. Anybody who does, who's following the enemy, who's decided that their own government consists of of, of I've made a decision for the way the things operate and I'm gonna put an effort towards it, will always produce more in the world than a Christian who says, I have Jesus, doesn't make a decision and puts no effort into it. They will have no kind of life, no kind of fruit, good or bad. Yeah. 
But somebody living out of the enemy kingdom, when they put, because the kingdom of God operates the same way, okay? Whether it be, whether it be uh, you know, operating out of the enemy or operating out of the, out of, out of the Lord, <clears throat> you put an effort towards something, something's going to happen. Spiritual and physical. If. <clears throat> it's the way it is. So what's the Lord doing? Well, first and foremost, <clears throat> that question you already ought to know. Because there's at no time, if you are following the Lord, I'm preaching to myself here. This is not an accusation. This is not an accusation from the enemy. But I'm going to tell you there is fire on this word. Okay? And a confrontation. And the Lord's not about to back off of the confrontation. And the confrontation is this. He is bringing the church into a place where they love him with all their heart. And they are not afraid because everything of what they, of what they thought they'd want to keep, all of that has been given up and there's no death that, that, that gives them a fear. Pastor David and I last week or week after, he came and saw me in, in the nursing home in rehab. <clears throat> we talked about the fact that it was a very important fact. He said, you know, I've got people and neighbors who say that Christians are the ones who are most afraid of dying. Ought never be. Ought never be. Because if we're living it right, we're, all, we're already living from a place where the old man is dead. The only thing that the enemy can tempt is the old man. He can't touch the new man. If we're living with anything that we're holding on to, where we have a mixture of him and the world, we're in a place where we can be defeated by the, by the enemy. Why? Because the fear of death will be what we, what we want to stay away from so we can have our stuff. Yeah, that's right. That's right. The Lord is taking the church right now in this country but not just in this country it's happening throughout the world it's happened in the world before it's been happening here now the lord is calling his people to a commitment and a level that is absolutely profound but it's not it's not a thing that's that's different it's the thing that always should have been there's a consecration that he is calling his people to right now because he's about to take those consecrated people and turn this world and turn this country upside down. Amen. The child who's, who's, who has a, a decision for government, that child takes the, the, the operating system of the government of God and brings it up. Listen, there is an influence that the Spirit of the Lord will call, will call those individuals who have that thing on the inside of them in the fire of God, and they will cause them to be influencers of countries, of cities, of school systems. And the Lord is doing that now. I'm telling you, I'm feeling this personally. The Lord is calling me by a different name, name that I, that I didn't dare think that I could have, where he, where, but I'm accepting what he is saying about who I am. So I'm agreeing with him. And I'm starting to get a fire in my belly that says, you go ahead at 69, at 70, at 72 years old, whenever you want, you send me out and you give me a sphere of influence and put your word in my mouth and I will preach your word because I can't contain the fire of who you are. Amen. And I will not only change that, I will influence the ones who are young for the next generations to come. I know you feel his fire if I've done my job right. Mm -hmm. 
I think the Lord's done. There's more that we could go into, and I could preach the whole Bible because every word of it's good. But, but Lord, I just thank you. I thank you, Lord, that it's not too late. I thank you, Lord, that 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 every place where every place that we are, that you're not there. I thank you, Lord, that you're finding us, taking us out of those places, bringing us into you, and the fire is falling upon the sacrifice on the altar. I thank you, Lord, that, you, that there is a... I thank you, Lord, for your fire, just plain and simple. I thank you, Lord, that there is no fear of death in you. I thank you, Lord, that to be with you is, is a whole lot better than to be here in this world. Uh, the Lord wants me to give you one other thing. I'm stopping this prayer. I'm going to give you this one thing. You have a passport. Do you know you have a passport to this world? You know what the passport that you have is? You have a passport of authority to be able to be an influence in the world because you have a body. Because you have a body, you can influence the world. They tried to take Jesus' body away so that he could have no influence and no authority in the world. So they killed him on a cross. And in hell, the devil looks at Jesus and says, you don't have any authority anymore. And Jesus says, no, I got a body that's waiting for me. I'm there and all authority on earth you can now never get rid of. Lord, bring us, bring us into you and let your kingdom come through us. Let us be, let us, let us, let us bring the fire. Let's tie, let us tie fire to the fox's tails to run through the, 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 the fields of the enemy. The Lord is ordaining you all as ones who are going forth to claim the land. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Father, I just release your blessing upon your people. And Father, I, I pray and, and step into uh, the ironic blessing where your face, because of your face, you put your name upon us because we can see you and behold you. We turn away from places where we have had a city, where we have tried to make a name for ourselves. Father, we freely give you uh, from a place of repentance. We tear down that sign that said, this city has my name on it. We take that sign off of the gate from over the gate of our own city. And we put your name up over our gates. And we glorify you, Father. Amen. Hallelujah. <clears throat> I didn't let give you the chance. This is an excellent message. Yes. It would be an excellent message even if I didn't say that. Okay, so I'm not going to say that. Ah, you. because I believe of where we're coming to. What we see out there on the horizon, we have choices to make and we'll have choices to make as to what we do and work because, I mean, if half the stuff that's been said is, is coming, but, but the coming things that are coming are to get the church in the right place. I just heard yesterday they said one of the fastest growing underground churches is in, is in Iran. 
And I remember being at a conference when there was, I believe it was Iran, Iranians, That's, yep. that was on the platform and they had them turn the speakers off and everything and said they wanted to talk but they didn't want to be visible. You know, the cameras and everything went off. Like you said, they said, you're praying, you've been praying for revival. We prayed for revival for a long time in Iran. That was when a whole lot of things were going on right then, which there is again now. And they said, be careful what you pray for because we prayed for years for revival and now we have it. But it was severe persecution and all that going on. That's right. And so this is a now word for now. We're gonna have choices in the coming, I mean, they're talking the economy is melting down and all these things. We're going to have choices to make. Are we going to fear God? Are we going to follow after God and walk in peace? Or are we going, ah, what are we going to do? That's right. You like that? Ah, what are we going to do? Yeah, because it's, it's easy when we're living a life of luxury and, and, and all these things to say things. But it's another thing to hear the voice of God Amen. as we walk in peace with what's coming. Amen? Amen. So, it's in our heart, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord no matter what comes, no matter what may. And next week, Eric, I won't be here. Eric's going to be here and going to minister to us. And uh, I'm going to watch it later on YouTube because I want to hear what's happened at your uh, fundraiser that you had with the church and all those things. I imagine you'll weave that in a little bit, you know, so uh, he's out there walking that out, which we all are, but he's right in the middle of a whole lot of things. Pardon? Yeah, you can give an update. If anybody has to leave, you can leave, but I don't think you're going to want to. Uh, Oh, your wife wants to leave. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll be brief. We have company coming. Actually, the, I would say the company that we're having coming today, our family members, um, Pete and Marie. Pete is Ukrainian. And his father is a pastor, and um, he was living in Ukraine during behind the Iron Curtain when the um, in the middle of the Cold War, and they actually were persecuted, and and he. Some really awful things his dad witnessed, watched one of his family members take him to the town square and burned burned alive. And, um, we were actually hoping he'd be here yeah, to fill us in we, on the frame of what's going on there. We were. Um, but they, uh, so that's who we're seeing today. Um, just a quick update. No, I, won't, I, I guess we had a great fundraiser la this this past week. Um, we've got, we're on the ground level of, uh, Delaware County and the Big Walnut School Board fight and everything that's going on in school boards. But I wanted to share with everybody that's here, I've been talking with a lady from who grew up in China and she went through Mao's overthrow. Her name is Xi Van Fleet. She's been on Hannity and a few different places. You've probably seen her on, if you watch any of those shows. Um, she is going to come. I had a conference call with her yesterday. She's going to come here in September. And she's going to speak. And I'm, I've also been in contact with a young lady, Morgan Ziegers, who is um, uh, she's tied in with Charlie Kirk and Turning Point USA. She's going to cut the two of them are going to come. Uh, we're still working on a date, but just in your mind, be uh, thinking about September. I'll let everybody know this one will be a, a less elegant thing. You know, the last one was a little expensive for the plates, but we're going to try to do this one at somewhere we can get a few thousand people um, and have them both speak on their experiences. Um, and so it'll be really, really good. She is, she's a really amazing lady. She said how, how to win is uh, faith and family, is how to, how to defeat what, what they're going through. So I want to just give that update, be, be looking for that. We want to promote this as much as possible um, because we are, raising money to you know basically fight on the ground floor and she lives in Loudoun County by the way she actually spoke at their at their yeah she probably lives near your daughter and she she's spoken at their school board meetings a couple times so yeah um, and she your thing about talking to the children was really really amazing because that's what she she actually lamented she said I've already I've lost my son he's already been taken over 
by the by the thoughts of the world and and she said now I've made it my life's purpose to to get the young people and um, you know and she's you know we're still praying for her son and everything but uh, hey we can't what what we, what we don't want to be is the people who didn't inherit the promises of the promised land and our children have to look back on us and say why why couldn't you believe God you know so I guess I'll say one more thing I, I want to the things of God just they 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 look like it's delayed gratification you know what I mean like the devil presents stuff to us like a lottery ticket and God's is like investing but down the road it becomes compound interest. And it's sometimes, I guess if you're looking for a way to understand what spirit you're hearing, if it's instant gratification to relieve you of something you're going through, you need to be really careful about that. Because God's ways are always, God's blessings are always presented, the gate is a test, and the test is a test of faith. And, on the, and inside of that gate is the blessing, but we've, it's always delayed gratification. Instant gratification is typically not of God. That's it. I'm gonna walk away from it and start preaching.